Hello and a warm welcome to all participants or in the name of FTT Group and M&M Software. I'm happy that a lot of you showed up for this uh, developer workshop today. My name is Volker Herbst. I'm the key account manager with M&M Software and I will be your host for this event together with uh, Glenn Schulz, managing director of the FTT Group and Katie Jones. Uh, she's responsible for the business office of the FTT Group. Many of you know M&M for years as a service provider for all facets of FTT, DTMs, frame applications, individual solutions, data-driven solutions on data from the field and so on. Since M&M, as well as I'm personally supporting FTT and the FTT Group since almost 20 years, I'm very happy to open this event today. Due to reasons all of you know, we have to to change this format last year from a face-to-face -face meeting to a virtual event. So today's event is the second virtual FTT developers seminar. So this brought the chance to be available for more participants from all over the world. So I think today we have about 150 registrations from Asia, Europe, Africa, North and South America. Um, and uh, this shows the huge interest of the new version of FTT, FTT3 respectively fits. For today, we created an interesting agenda which shows new and important details of FTT3 as well as it presents an overview of, the, of this technology. We will also see demos of different systems uh, products. Um, before Glenn Schulz start with the first presentation, I would uh, would like to say some words concerning our uh, interactivity during this event. Uh, during the presentations, all participants are muted. Nevertheless, you are invited to write your pres uh, your questions and comments into the chat. After each presentation, we will forward these topics to each presenter to be answered. So I, I will give you a short introduction to our agenda and then we would start with the first presentation. You can see the agenda here on your screen. Give me a second. So we will start with a, a presentation uh, regarding FTT3 overview. It will be held by Glenn Schulz. The second topic would be DTM Inspector for FTT3. So we will see details about testing and test and certification of uh, FTT3. Then we will see, uh, in, we will get some information about the common components for FTT3. This will be uh, following by uh, using an F OPC UA client with FTT server. This will be held by Thomas Hartlich. Then we will see features of the FTT3 desktop common component. We will see a, a short demonstration and some details about it. So nearly at the end, Glenn Schulz will explain some details about licensing and the agreements you need for using FTT3. And at the end, we will get an uh, IOLink interpreter demonstration, which I will do by myself. An important notice at that point of uh, in the seminar, this session will be recorded and so it will be available also after this presentation later on. So we, we, are, we have seen these details about the agenda. So we can start with the first presentation. Um, I would hand over to Glenn Schulz for the first topic on this agenda. He's the managing director of the FTT Group. Uh, since I know him, he's a great in, uh, he's a great inspiration for FTT technology. The screen is yours, Glenn. Give me. A... Um... So. Glenn, do, do you get the presentation mode? Yep. Yes, great. Thank you, Volker. 
Yes, thank you and welcome everybody. It's great to be with you here today virtually, <laughs> although I have always enjoyed the in person event uh, in the Stuttgart area. Hopefully that'll return by next year. I think it's always nice to see each other face to face. And I also want to in advance thank all the uh, leaders of the FDT group who have offered to do presentations here on their subject matter expertise. I think it'll make it uh, that much more interesting and informative. So what I'd like to do here briefly today is to give you an overview on uh, what's new in FDT3. Hopefully you've all had a chance to spend some time looking at the features and capabilities, but just to call attention to some of the highlights in this in terms of what's new in FDT3 is that it's, it's platform independent. So while in the past, I think it's fair to say most realizations of FDT were primarily on a Microsoft platform, it's now platform independent. There's one ton runtime image that will work on Microsoft, Linux, and Apple operating systems. And this applies to both the DTM components of the standard and the server components of the standard. One major shift as a result of some of this is that we made it accessible through browsers. So instead of having to have a desktop application like we have in the past, now nearly all the features of the FDT3 standard can be accessed by a standard browser. And the nice thing is this makes it um, available with responsive displays on virtually any uh, platform that you may wanna access it from. So you can use your smartphone, uh, you could get it through a tablet, a notebook, or of course even a browser on a desktop computer is a possible means of access. The architecture is now server-based architecture, so all users can be supported by a single instance of a server uh, for that enterprise. That server could be located at a local facility. If you're a multi-location facility, the server could be located at an enterprise level. You can also take advantage of more modern architectures by moving it to the edge on an edge computer of the enterprise, or you can fully move it up into the cloud uh, and operate it in that environment so that you aren't hosting an actual server. Uh, because of this highly flexible architecture based on that server, all communications in and out of the server are authenticated and encrypted. So we spent a lot of time looking at the security aspects of this. In fact, we had a separate security committee working side by side with our architect and specification group when this new standard was created to ensure that we approach this from a secure perspective. Now, even though it's server-based architecture, I just wanna clarify that the desktop version of FDT uh, is still available. And in fact, you'll get a demonstration of that today by Manfred Gundel. So while we'll talk a lot about the server, the desktop has many of the same features and capabilities. And then a really important feature that we started heavily with on FDT2 already is native OPC UA support. So the nice thing about the way this is architected, and Thomas Hadlick will walk you through this in some detail, is that all DTMs automatically support OPC UA. So if you're a DTM developer, the architecture is such that you need to do nothing special in your DTM to make it OPC UA compatible, which is, I think, a huge advantage to our developers community in that they aren't burdened with a whole bunch of OPC UA issues as you're architecting your DTM. It basically comes along for free as Thomas will show you. And our FDT server common components includes what you could call a pre-wired, a pre-configured OPC UA server as part of the deliverable code. And so if you're on the server side of things, um, you don't have to worry about how you integrate an OPC UA server into the FDT server, which is another major advantage of the new standard. And then probably one of the most requested end user features was a way to get ac easy access to the DTMs that they needed. I know many of our developer community has gone to great lengths to put hosting features on your websites to make it easy to find your DTMs, but with 
you know, hundreds of vendors out there to have to visit everybody's website to not all of them put as much attention and detail into it as you did. Um, it's a challenge to find DTMs to uh, support an FDT application. So with FDT3, we clean that all up. All FDT3 DTMs are certified and automatically placed in an infrastructure that's called the FDT Hub. And this FDT Hub is available through an API from the desktop and server-based applications so that when a DTM is needed, the application can automatically find that DTM up in the hub. If you haven't seen it, this is our overall architectural view of the FDT3 standard. And I'm not going to walk through all the details of this, but I'd just like to point out some major areas for you so that it kind of grounds you as the various experts talk about their uh, facets of the architecture. Um, from a, from a um, this is the main server that you see here in the rectangle in the center. And most of this is delivered by the common components. So you can see there's the core server is part of this. The uh, OPC UA server, the web server is all part of the server common components. Now, if you are a server vendor, there's plenty of opportunity for value add, either in integrating it in a larger application or making a bigger and better FDT server. And you see these areas here as possible areas. Here is the FDT hub where the, all the DTMs, FDT3 DTMs are stored in the cloud. And this server application can through its API here gain access to any of those DTMs and download them for use by the server. On the user side of things over to the right here, you can see there can be a number of approaches to user interfaces. So, as I mentioned, it's all browser-based, so any browser that's authorized and that the individual has credentials for can use the server through that technique. You can still use it through a desktop application or a tablet browser application. You can access it through OPC UA, and Thomas Hodlick will talk about this in some detail, so you can have an OPC UA client. You can also take that OPC UA capability and integrate data from the FDT server into the ERP system. So you can directly map production related data from the sensors and devices on the plant floor into ERP applications. Then over on this side, you see that we're capable of supporting any type of industry, uh, whether it's industrial, hybrid, and so on. And then finally over here, you can see that the server itself can be deployed in a number of situations, as I mentioned before, cloud, on-premise, and even still operate this as a desktop environment, as you'll see shortly. Just a brief introduction to some of the presentations you'll see today. There are developer tools that are available, and you'll hear from the people that are responsible for these tools, so our leaders in the organization. There is the DTM common components, and these help you to develop and deploy these platform agnostic DTMs. It's based on Visual Studio, and it does include a sample DTM to get you started. The server common components allow you to deploy the full FDT server. And as I mentioned, it includes both the web and OPC UA server built in and pre-configured. There's extensible features in the server, but you could just literally compile it and launch it virtually as is, and you'd have a working server. This too is in the Visual Studio environment. And then the desktop common components, this looks more like our legacy single user architecture, but as you'll see, it now adds FDT3 DTM support, and this is also in a Visual Studio environment. And then James will talk to you about our new DTM inspector that's important to you as a developer that helps you pre-test your compliance to the standard prior to your required certification of your DTM. Then one other thing that's new with FDT3 is we have a brand new FDT3 style guide, and it really is a very nice document. The, the committee there did some fantastic work. Um, and the idea of the style guide, as always, is just to provide a consistent user experience. 
and yet allow for plenty of vendor creativity. So the idea that the user would find the menus basically all in the same places, that icons would be the same and so on. But because FDT3 is now browser-based, we have to have a responsive design that essentially adjusts to the aspect ratio and resolution of the device that you're accessing the FDT server through. It also now, because of these types of devices, has to support things like soft keyboards and touchscreen features, which we didn't have to directly address in the past desktop only version of FDT. And then we also included a standard FDT3 icon library as part of that deliverable. The one point about this FDT3 style guide, if you're a long-term user of the FDT standard, you may have recognized that we had a style guide with FDT 1.2, and you could choose whether to be tested with that style guide or not. With FDT 2, we moved one step closer and we said, okay, you have to be tested to the style guide and your certificate will show whether you passed or failed that test. Now with FDT3, we've taken the final step and it is required that the DTM must pass compliance as James will explain to you. And that includes this new style guide certification as part of that mandatory compliance. That's it for my introduction to FDT3. We wanna get on to the main presenters here today who have all the detailed information for you on this, but I would just pause briefly to see if there's any questions that anybody might have. I'm just looking at the chat feature and I don't see any there, but I'll just pause briefly in case anybody wants to type any in or if a moderator wants to point one out to me. Good, perfect. Well then, Folker, I turn it back to you so we can get on with the presenters. Thank you very much, Glenn, for this great overview of FTT. I think we had a short introduction on each important topic of this technology. So thank you very much. Um, so last chance. No, it's not the last chance to uh, write in questions. I think uh, you can uh, ask your questions at any time during this event. So we will try to answer it at any time. So next presenter on our agenda is um, um, James. Uh, he's working for Yokogawa and he's the chairman of the test and certification working group. He's very committed to this important part of FTT. His presentation will teach us all, uh, all the worst knowing details about the test and certification tool DTM inspector for FTT3. So James, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Give me a second to hand over the presentation mode to you. Um, so, so James, it's yours. I think you are mu muted, James. Yes, hello. Yeah, I better hear Hi, me. James. Now we can hear you and you, okay. we can see your screen. Okay, let let just get the slides out. Okay, you are able to see yes. the screen? Okay. We, we okay hello, great. everyone. Okay, I'm um, James, okay, the chair of the Working Group Tests and Certification. Okay, so I've been in this role since uh, 2017. And uh, by the way, I'm uh, working for Yokogawa and based in Singapore. Okay, so the topic for me today, okay, I will give you an insight, a brief insight into the new DTN inspector for FTT3. Okay, this is my agenda. Okay, so first we will go through a recap of the evolution of the DTA inspector. Okay, then we'll take a look at what is new with regards to certification for FTT3. Okay, and then we'll look at what are the changes that we will see in the new DTA inspector, which we have called DTA inspector 
five. Okay, then I will give you a quick uh, demo on the DTA Inspector 5 and also a quick information of how to get the DTA Inspector 5 tool itself. Okay, let's do a recap. So what is DTA Inspector? Okay, I think to most of you, this is already a tool which you are familiar with. Okay, so this tool is used by the FTT test site for the certification of DTMs. Okay, it is also used uh, by developers to subject their DTMs for their own internal testing. Okay, so typically you will do this internal testing okay, before you officially submit your DTM to the test site for certification. Okay, so what are the versions of the DTA inspector that we have to date? So for the FTT version one, okay, we have the DTA inspector three. Okay, for the FTT version two, we have the DTA inspector four. Okay, and now with FTT three, we have we have retained the name, okay, but now we call it the DTM Inspector 5. Okay, so what's new for certification with regards to FTT3? Okay, so this point has been mentioned by Glenn. So the first thing is that style guide test has been made mandatory to pass. So, uh, and all certified DTMs okay, will be uploaded and also hosted on the FTT hub. Okay, so with this, this actually provides a, a way for users to find, automatically find and download DTMs from a single location. Okay, so this hub allows for automatic device discovery and also notifications when new DTM updates are available. And also vendors can manage their DTMs okay, with some kind of a user role access privileges. Okay, so what will we see for DTA Inspector 5? Okay, so to make the learning curve uh, small for developers, okay, we have mainly enhanced DTA Inspector 4 and evolve it into DTA Inspector 5. Okay, of course, this means that uh, because FTT3 is not totally new, so it's built based on some FTT2 specification. Okay, so all the relevant existing FTT2 test cases are retained and then updated to adapt them to the FTT3 specification. Okay, so then many of these test cases will actually be familiar to you already. Okay, of course, uh, we will also include new requirement that is uh, specified by the FTT3 specification document. Okay, so there'll be a slightly more number of cases that you will see in Detail Inspector 5. Okay, one, one major change is that if you if you are familiar with the FTT2, okay, style guide test cases were executed on a separate environment. Okay, so, so we had a kind of a Linux-based platform which you will access the test case. Okay, but to make things even simpler, okay, we have now in incorporated style guide test case as part of the Detail Inspector 5. Okay, so this enhancement actually reduces okay, the effort for the developers okay, and also provides them with uh, additional test coverage before submitting your DTM for actual certification. 
Okay, so let's take a quick review of the DTN Expector 5. Okay, so first I'm going to close this PowerPoint. I can bring up the tools. Okay, so the first tool will be the topology planning. Okay, so this is the same as what we are doing for FTT2. Okay, so this, this remains unchanged. So the topology tool, okay, you use it to build your actual uh, testing environment. Okay, so here we have some uh, uh, sample dummy communication DTM by MNN. And, and also, okay, we will add some sample device. Okay, so with this topology built, okay, similarly, we will save this okay, as a project. Okay, so you save it to the desktop. Okay, subsequently, when this is done, okay, then we are we'll be ready to move to the DTM Inspector 5 itself. Okay, as you can see, the user interface is pretty much unchanged. Okay, so the, the only obvious difference you will see now is probably this area here. Okay, so we have the style guide test cases in this location. Okay, so if you have already, uh, for, for this demo, I've actually created the test campaign in advance. Okay, so I'm going to just call out the one I created earlier. Okay, so the area will break to separate into two, one for the conformity test case and one for the style guide test cases. Okay, so as the conformity test cases remains unchanged, okay, I will not uh, talk about this. Okay, the style guide test case, as the specification calls, okay, there will be two sets of uh, similar test case, okay, whereby one set that starts with a FS, okay, this is uh, intended for full screen testing. Okay, and those that start with a MS that's meant for mobile screen testing. So it's, it's typically the same two sets with the same test case, but it will be run twice. Okay, so I'll show you the typical layout of one of the test case. Okay, so to make things simpler for the developer as well as for the test site testers, okay, we, we have included the screenshots that you will find within the style guide specification. Okay, so this means that when you are testing, you actually don't have to go forward and backwards to refer to the style guide specification. Okay, so in, in this particular test case, which checks for the identification area, okay, so we have uh, taken a screenshot of the generic identification area. Okay, then we have shown an example of a image of a DTM. So what the what you need to do okay is to check the result over here okay, whether your DTM layout conform or do not conform or maybe this particular 
aspect is not applicable for your DTM. Okay, so every single uh, test description will have its own results. Okay, so only when you have uh, rightly mark every result within the whole test case, okay, then the test case will allow you to proceed with uh, closing the test case itself. Okay, so, so this kind of a layout is uh, repeated okay, for both uh, online as well as off offline DTMs that your DTM may have. Okay, so, so although the style guide test case is built here, okay, you, you can see that they are typically not automated as compared to the conformity test case. Okay, so that's uh, because style guide test case is uh, still uh, pretty much you have to manually uh, judge as compared by comparing your DTM side by side. Okay, so uh, this is probably the only change that you will see for DTM Inspector 5. Okay, let's, let me bring back my last slide. Okay, so to, to get this DTM Inspector 5, okay, you can contact the business office okay, for a developer license. Okay, I think this is the same way that you have always been uh, obtaining your DTM Inspector uh, 3 or 4. Okay, maybe uh, towards the end where Glenn talks about the licensing, that we have uh, more information over there. Okay, if not, this will be the end of my presentation. We open the questions to the floor. So thank you very much, James. I think up to now we have no questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah, we can always address it at the end as well. So one question from my side, is there any okay. change regarding the test and certification process itself? Okay, the, the process still remains uh, mainly the same. Okay, so the applicants will send the updated certification declaration form to the test site. Mm -hmm. okay, the test site will do the testing process and upload the result to the business office. Okay, then the business office will use the backend tools to extract the results, the data, and then finally issues the certificate in both the PDF as well as the XML. The only thing extra is that now this certified DTM will be uploaded to the uh, FTT hub. Okay, so only a small change to the certification process we are used to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, James. I think. Thank you. No if problem. there is any question later on, we can ask you again. So then let's go ahead on our agenda. Next topic would be the common components um, uh, for FTT3. And uh, this is, uh, give me a second, then you can see the, the agenda again. So you can see it. This is the, we are at that topic, the common components for FTT3. This is split into two presentations. One presentation from Manjunat, from, he's the uh, DTM CCB chairman. And the second one, from Renato, he's the FTT server CCB chairman. Um, I would now hand over in the first step to, to Manjunat from Flow, uh, he's, he's also from FlowServ. And Manjunat, 
I hand it over the presentation mode to you. So we can not hear you, maybe you are muted. Manjunat, we can't hear you. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah. No, no, it's no. We can hear you. Great. Okay. And able to see my screen, hopefully. Uh, yes, we can see your screen also. Yeah. Thank you, Oka. So, I uh, once again welcome you all to the workshop. And uh, I'm Manjana Tachutana, working as principal. R&D engineer for digital technology at Floso. I've been uh, in the role for a month now. I'd like to thank Thomas who was taking care of this for the first couple of months in the same role of uh, DTM chairman. So um, as part of the agenda for this half an hour session that I will be covering, I will go through the DTM common component and I'll be presenting to the team members whose work has led to the release of a couple of common components. Then what's new with FDT3, the architecture overview, the role of communication manager and assemblies and then synchronization. And as, as we have been pointing out, so the learning curve would be there from FDT2 and over to FDT3 so that um, the Delta part is very less for developers to learn and improve. So, um, so DTM CCB, and I would like to take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to the CCB team members for their extended effort, teamwork and contributions to achieve the set milestones. And this whole team meets on a monthly basis to review and to see what new features and the sets that can be included into the common component level. And so going forward, so the DTM common component, so what's new in this? So it's again common component, we have been familiar with FDT2 and now those interfaces have been moved to FDT3 and FDT3 common components is based on the .NET library and the common component as usual, it ensures the correctness of standard FDT workflows. It provides a set of implementation rules, which really helps to minimize any interop and compatibility issues that arise up. And the next is as a guidelines for all of these developers, DTM with a custom code from different vendors, you have common implementation rules for interfaces, thread safety, Reading rules, exception handling, and cloning of the data objects. So, in the upcoming slides, I will touch base the topics which would help you, the common components, to achieve uh, these. So, uh, at a high level architecture overview, so some of you are familiar with FDT2 would be knowing this. So, the DTM uh, is always presented for the frame application. If you could see as a common component and it's always placed between your frame application and the custom code. So the DTM common component, it implements the all the interaction rules you could see between your custom code and the frame application. So the frame application and all these interfaces that you see is based on the FDT3 interfaces, which we'll be talking through in detail. And the interaction between the custom code and the DTM common component is based on the combination of custom code interfaces and some of them with the device model and just and the FDT3 interfaces onto the frame application. The internal structure of the DTM component, you could see they are arranged in layers. It shows the same behavior, the frame application and on the custom code side. So the layers you could see uh, basically for the signal execution, signal adapters that take care of the state machine checking 
and the thread resolution from outside world and every signal will be routed to a specific manager which will take care of the signal processing so this is a very high level overview of it if you go in detail so each of the incoming and outgoing updated signal you could see is processed by the execution engine the execution engine checks if signal execution is allowed based on the state machine and sends it on routes it to the corresponding managers the dtm common component uses two interaction controllers for your for communication with device model and the fdt frame via the lifetime manager so the two controllers basically controls the initialization and release of calls and the other performs the thread management and implements the threading rules now since it's based on the threads and threading rules if the deadlock has occurred then you can check the state transitions of these interaction controllers to see the call sequence and the state machine changes and there are a couple of other managers the topology manager allows performing the communication with the child dtms with the parent and other operations over dtm the configuration manager it basically handles the interactions related to the catalog scan vendor name and other and the parameter manager it includes the parameters that are being called for the checking we move on this is the most important and the communication manager it handles the parent communication basically via a parent channel and with respect to the child communication via its own channels and in concurrence with the online state machine you could see for the start and stop operations so this ensures the correctness of the fdt workflows the i the communication interface is the entry point for the channel and the subscription interface extends the communication entry point of a channel uh, with a device for data transfer functionality the i parent communication interface is used by the custom code device model it implements the interface to provide access to the parent communication channel provides functionality for dtm connecting disconnecting and sending the communication requests additionally it provides functionality to inform about the finished device type check the child communication interface is the entry point for the channels for the com dtm or the gateway dtm and this interface must be implemented by the dtm customer the dtm common component uses this interface for channel related communication so the overall rationale is it uh, with this we are trying to ensure the correctness of the standard fdt workflows it implements the state machine and checks operations against it and it's all comes with a pre built moving on to the next slide so this slide will be touch basic with the common component assemblies um, so the common component assemblies on this slide are in blue and the custom code assemblies are in and then green the solid arrows between the common components uh, indicates that the assemblies uh, dependencies and the the dotted arrows is the logical connection um, between uh, the components and the, there are multiple as you see so i'll walk through some of them the contract assembly you could see that it contains all the definitions for the dtm common component specific types interfaces and exceptions therefore the contract assembly this particular assembly is being referenced by almost all other assemblies the next is the info builder 
assembly it contains the implementation of dtm info that is primarily needed for the fdt catalog scan during the catalog scan the info builder loads the uh, the dtm configuration uh, from the custom code the core assembly contains the main implementation of the dtm common component during installation of the dtm it loads the primary device model and the dtm static function from the custom code it provides the fdt 3 interface to the frame application and controls all interactions during the dtm runtime and go on to the infrastructure assembly this contains the classes which provide additional functionality for the dtm common component and the custom code like logging and doing the states machine support the next is the dtm operation assembly it provides the functionality to execute asynchronous operation the assembly is used by the dtm common component and the custom code so moving to the next slide uh, so this talks about the interactions and the synchronization concerning the thread behavior so the interaction uh, between fdt3 components is based on multi threading and threads are not determinist so to make the execution of call sequences more deterministic the fdt spec it defines a set of threading rules about runtime dtm behavior with set of responsibilities for dtm common component and custom code the dtm common component itself is designed according to the fdt threading rules the custom code shall also follow the threading rules the dtm common component checks the behavior of the custom code if it technically possible so each coming incoming and the outgoing fdt signal is processed by the execution engine each signal from and to the custom code is processed by the interaction controller interaction controller and the execution engine they have the same internal logic but they differ in their configuration with respect to the state machine the execution engine uses two queues for both directions and separate queues help to avoid blocking during of possible uh, nested calls and both queues uh, they work identically on the next slide and this talks about the synchronization in detail so the queue consists of as we said two internal queues the task queue and the signal queue the signal queue is primarily the low level queue which is used for low level synchronization of for all signals all incoming outgoing calls are queued and processed sequentially in a dedicated thread different queues for incoming and outgoing calls they can be processed in parallel the task queue is a high level queue it is used for task signals and the primary task signals are asynchronous operations which begin and finish with a long time on the lead so the if that can contain a sequence of other fdt sub operations as well so the long time fdt operation can be started parallel uh, with other uh, fdt operations so in overall um, in a nutshell we with the common components the dtm side you provide a common fdt behavior to decouple the custom or the system specific and the device specific implementation which in a overall um, will give say reduce the interoperability issues and the efforts uh, to troubleshoot and and make the system work uh, flawlessly 
that's all from today's uh, presentation from my end. Wait for any questions. Thank you, Manjunat. Thank you very much. Um, I have to apologize to the audience because I just realized that I have overlooked some questions uh, regarding the last presentations. And I think one question is just for you, Manjunat. Um, are there some test cases over, uh, excuse me, are there some test cases cover the exposing of device parameters? While IIoT is, is a major use case of FTT3, it's important to guarantee all DTM will expose parameters properly. I think uh, um, to the max extent, uh, it's been reviewed, but uh, uh, I would get back to this uh, uh, specific question with further more details. Sorry, I didn't get you. Uh, I, I said I'll get back to this question with further more details. The answer is it's uh, it's yes. Um, I'm audible. So hello. What what kind of details you need? Hello. Um, I I think we have a, a, yeah, a bad communication Thomas? at the moment. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I, uh, I've seen yeah. Thomas could answer. Thomas, yes. you can unmute you. Maybe you can answer it, or do you like to answer it later? Okay. Thomas, uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, so, uh, yes, we do have tests. Uh, in regard to, to providing the, the uh, parameters from a DTM. This is, uh, I, I can answer this because this is also very important for the OPC servers. And, uh, but these tests are specific for protocols. So it's, it's not specific for the DTM CC, but it's uh, a protocol specific test because the different protocols have different parameter sets that need to be exposed. So, uh, for instance, if you test the DTM for heart, uh, in the heart specific test, uh, there should be some tests for specific parameters. Um, I think it was also the question. Yes, um, I hope we could answer this question. So, I think if not, please. Add an additional question, uh, whoever asked this. Uh, I think we have another, uh, I think it's everything is test case uh, uh, related here in the test. I would propose, let's go ahead with the agenda and we will ask James regarding this test uh, related questions after this block about common components. So, um, so then, thank you very much, Manjunat. Um, I would directly hand over to Renato. Uh, he the, takes the second part of the Common Components uh, presentations. So, Renato, are you? Yes, Renato, we can see you, but yeah, no, your presentation uh, you is. Can, but you can hear me now, I think. Yes, can hear you, and but I can't see your presentation at the moment. What part can you see from the yes, presentation? Yes, yes, it's fine. You see the presentation directly, okay? No, no, yes. Not presentation mode, okay? It's in presentation mode, and we can hear you fine, so you can okay. start your presentation. So. Thank you. So, hello and welcome to the presentation regarding the FTT server CCB. Okay. Uh, I want to show you following topics, the introduction about myself. What is the FTT server CCB? What is the current state 
of the COM components? What are the planned changes and enhancements for the COM components? And at the last topic, I want to ask for feedback for the COM components. So let's start with the first topic. Introduce myself. So I'm Renato Gonzalez. I'm 36 years old. I live in Germany and I'm working for the company Hilscher since eight years. Hilscher is a manufacturer and service provider for communication solutions and automation. Uh, my main work is developing a frame application. And since this year, I'm also working in the FTT3 DTM development. Since the beginning of this year, I'm also the chairman of the FTT server CCV. So in the next topic, I want to show you what the FTT server CCV is. So in the FTT server change control board, we discuss the changes enhancements and bugs. We discuss the priority, severity, and also possible solutions. In the FTT server CCB, we are 10 members from, uh, from, from different companies, and we meet us once a month to discuss the topics. In the FTT server CCB, we are responsible for following COM components, the desktop COM components, and the FTT server COM components. So, what is each COM component? The desktop CC is intended for frame applications which will run on a desktop PC, like uh, the frame applications which are already available for FTT 1 and 2. The difference here is that it's also possible to work with FTT 3 DTMs. In the picture, you can see a frame application which is based on the desktop CC to open the FTT3 DTM UI, which is an HTML page. Uh, later in the seminar, this should be topic five, you will see the desktop CC in a live demo. Mm, the FTT server CC is the new way for IoT solutions. It is operation system independent and provides more flexibility. I think in the next presentation in this seminar, you will see, for example, how OPC client works with FTT server. In the right side of this picture, you can see a web frame application, which is opened over a web browser where DTM UI can be seen, where the web frame application is, is um, stored in the web server of this part. So let's go over to the next topic and take a look on the current state of the CCs. This year, several bug fixes was done in the desktop CC. I will tell you some examples reported by the CCB members. Um, one bug was that it was not possible to install two DTMs with the same identifier but with different versions. This is valid regarding to the FTT3 specification. So this issue was discussed and solved. Another issue which was reported was that it must be clarified how the newest available FTT3 DLLs for the frame application can be loaded by the CC. This was also solved. This were only a few examples. In addition, several changes and enhancements were collected for the FTT server CC. Also, uh, several changes and enhancements were collected and a budget plan was created for next year. Um, so let's see what the plan changes and enhancements are. For the desktop CC, it is planned to provide also the DTM installer, which is already available for the FTT server CC. In this way, it is possible to install DTMs over the frame application directly. Also, it's planned to include SS to the FTT Hub. The FTT Hub is a DTM repository where it's possible to search for DTMs from different vendors. A possible use case with this feature is that it would be possible to load a project and a missing DTM can be downloaded directly from the FTT Hub. With the included DTM installer, it would be possible to install this DTM also directly. And corresponding to this, it is also planned to provide a partial reload catalog. Uh, in this way, it is possible 
to add a new installed DTM directly to the catalog of the frame application without a need to start a huge reload catalog process. Also with this enhancement, it would be possible to make a partial reload catalog for a specific generic DTM, which gets a new EDS file to represent this device also in the catalog without the need of a huge reload catalog process. Mm. For the FTT server CC, it is planned to provide the possibility to edit and create projects. This means to create a new project or to modify an existing one by adding or removing devices. Uh, this feature will be added in the FITS core server part. And what is also planned is to provide an extended documentation so the user knows how to work with the FTT server CC or how to create an own web frame UI or how to observe or to assess the data or how a user can integrate FITS core server to its own application. Also for the FTT server CC, it is planned to include access to the FTT hub for the same reason like in the desktop CC. In addition, it is planned to provide the possibility to configure the DTM state. Uh, th this means, depending on the use case of the user, if the DTM should go directly online or not when the project gets loaded. Mm. So, let us go to the last topic, and this one is to request feedback. Um, what else would you like to see included in the CCs? Mm. Do you have any suggestions or proposals? Mm. And I wanted to say in advance, if, if you can think, think of something later, please feel free to contact me. You can see also my email address. Mm. Yes, this, if there are no, no questions also, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Renato. Um, I have here one question. I think it's uh, what is the plan timeline to implement edit create pro projects in FTT server CC? Yeah, this is really a good question. <laughs> this, this I, I can't say at the moment because we must discuss also with. with uh, uh, being shanked from M1M &M to, to see how long it will take. Uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's a known topic, but uh, we have to discuss right. uh, what is the timeline. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Renato. There's another question. Can all common components be, be bundled together to avoid CC conflicts for developers? I'm not sure if I understand it in the right way. Mm, I Maybe think it's standard correct is what it could be possible that there are uh, different FTT3 DLLs, for example, which can be loaded. And uh, from the FTT3 specification, if I'm correct, um, it should be possible to always load the, the newest one. It is located also in the special folder. So the CC should be responsible to load the newest FTT3 DLLs. So there should be no conflict in this case. I hope I have understood it correctly. The response is okay for, for the person. Yeah, hopefully. Otherwise, uh, uh, I, please uh, add uh, more details to the question and we can. Uh, handle this question later on. So, uh, Manjunath and Renato, thank you very much for your presentations about common components. Um, I think then we can, can go ahead to the uh, next uh, presentation. So, on our walk through the FTT3 world, our next landmark, let's say it in these words, is uh, using an OPCA client with the FTT server. Uh, Thomas Hartlich from Rockwell is the chairman of the architecture and specification working group, and he will show us how connecting and browsing the project, project structure by using OPC or UA. So Thomas, I will hand over to you and give me a second. So.
So Thomas, I'm looking forward to your presentation and demo. Okay, so I think you should see my screen. And yes, we can hear and see you. Okay, great. So, yes, uh, my name is Thomas Hartlich. I'm working for not many years uh, for Rockwell Automation now. Uh, uh, I've been active with this FTT group uh, for quite some time, I think something above 20 years. Uh, I have different roles in FTT Group. I'm the chairman of Working Group ANS and also the chairman of uh, Project Group OPC UA. And since I have the chance to speak, I would like to uh, make some, some explanations in my role as, as chairman of Working Group ANS. Uh, so I, I saw some, some questions uh, in regard to uh, specific protocol. And uh, somebody that asked, oh, is this protocol supported with FTP3? And I want to point out that the work on, on support for the protocols is organized in different project groups. A project group is uh, something that's uh, typically active for a specific project, for a specific target. And if the target is reached, then the project uh, is finished and the project group uh, rests and so we have different pro uh, project groups for the different protocols and some of the project groups already have provided support for FTT3. Some project groups are working on the topic and, and there are some project groups who do not have started the work for this. Participation in the project group is open to all FTT group members. So if you feel the need for support of a protocol in, in, a, in FTT3, uh, there's a possibility for you to, to get active. And just uh, to answer the question that we saw earlier, there are two project groups for, for CAN-based protocols. So we have a project group for CAN-open and a project group for CIP. The project group CIP is active working on support for FTT3, the project group for can open is not active at this point of time. Okay, and now changing my role again, back to, to uh, chair of project group OPC UA, uh, I would like to give you this presentation. Actually, the topic is quite uh, a little bit uh, challenging. So looking at the at the uh, FTT server only from, from client point of view is uh, something I'm, I'm not really used to. So I hope I can really, you know, race to the challenge. Okay, in my presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the project group OPC UA. So that's uh, the project group uh, supporting the OPC UA information model. Uh, on the FIT server overview, Glenn already did a very nice task uh, on, on, on a very nice job on presenting that. Uh, so we can cut this short. Uh, then I want to talk about how to connect to the FIT server via OPC UA. Uh, talk about pausing the project structure. And then uh, if we have time, we can also talk about how to access the device information. Uh, so the project group OPC UA actually is a joint working group between OPC Foundation and FTT Group. So we not only have members of FTT Group participating in that project group, but also a company coming from OPC Foundation. And the project group is uh, in, in the current uh, Shape is active since 2017. Before that, we already had some OPC related activity, but, but basically the project as we have it today is, is, has been initially started in 2017. So we have members from, from a number of companies. Uh, since the project is you know, sometimes more active, sometimes less active, uh, the participation also, uh, you know, varies. All those uh, members are volunteers. 
and sometimes the day job uh, needs more time and sometimes they have more resources to participate in, in this uh, joint project. Uh, we have uh, a monthly meeting, so in this times and also before COVID, uh, we used mostly web conferences. Uh, since we do some prototyping, we actually had some some face-to-face uh, -face meetings where we tested software and, and you know uh, tried to solve problems that we have. Our most recent uh, re work result is the. OPC UA companion specification for FDT. We now have a um, uh, version 1.1, which is published by OPC Foundation and by FDT Group. And this OPC companion spec is based on the OPC UA uh, specification for, for devices. So uh, the OPC UA for devices is, is a very fundamental. Uh, definition for, for rep representing different kinds of devices. Uh, OPC, so the FIT server overview, Glenn already uh, introduced the, the FIT server. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus on the part that's related to, to OPC UA. So uh, inside the FIT server, we have an, an OPC UA server component and that is going to provide uh, data to OPC UA clients uh, and, and those clients can come in any shape. Uh, the general structure uh, already has been defined uh, in, in the FTT2 specification so, so this exists at least since 2017. Uh, if, uh, if we start on the right hand side, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Uh, let me, let's, let's try this. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the physical network. So we have some, at the, at the host, we have some field bus interface. Uh, then there are different devices uh, and, and we have a gateway which is uh, used to connect uh, field device DNA. And basically in, in a frame application, those different devices are represented by DTMs. So uh, we have a DTM and communication DTM for the field bus interface. Uh, we have uh, the, and, and field device uh, and device DTM for for this field device. We have a gateway DTM for for the gateway device, and then again we have uh, device DTMs for for those field devices. And until here, until frame application, everything is very common uh, FTT. So that's the normal FTT. So the the OPC specific part starts starts here with the OPC UA information model. And in OPC UA, the information is organized in nodes. And so we have nodes for representing the, the uh, field bus interface. So the target here is not to represent the DTM, but the target is to represent the devices, the physical devices. And those are represented based on the DT information that are provided by the DTMs. So uh, the, the information model is built from, from information that is provided by the DTMs. And it's uh, very independent from the DTMs, we are able to represent uh, DTMs that support standard protocols as well as DTMs that uh, provide, uh, uh, that are based on, on uh, proprietary uh, protocols. And then this, this OPC UA server provides an OPC UA interface and then OPC UA client can, can access the information model using the standard OPC UA uh, services. Okay. 
uh, yes, the connection uh, connecting to the FIT server via OPC basically is, is based on the general rules for an OPC UA connection. So uh, we are able to provide security based on authentication. So the clients, the servers, and also uh, users uh, can prove their identity. Uh, the, we have authorization. So uh, basically the access permissions can be defined at the level of, of client access to a server or even access for a specific user. It's possible to restrict access uh, for, for some users or not. Uh, and also uh, confidentiality uh, is provided by, by data encryption. And uh, integrity is also a topic basically that uh, um, that's uh, related to making sure that the data received by the receiver is the same data as sent by the sender. And, and we have a bi-directional connection, so the data can be sent uh, from the server or it can be sent from the client. And, and we can have encryption and, and uh, integrity, ensure integrity in both directions. Uh, there's an, basically the connection is created first by, by creating a secure channel. Uh, there basically we, we use, uh, at, at this level we provide uh, encryption and, and uh, can make sure that, uh, about the identity between client and server. And then basically the, the actual application, uh, for the actual application we need an, an session. And here we have user authorization and, and also the, the identity of the user is provided. And session typically is provided with a timeout. So, uh, and, and uh, when the timeout uh, runs out, uh, the, the keys for, for the session is updated so that uh, we, we make sure uh, that the uh, a very high level of security can be provided. And in general, uh, on, on transport layer, we, we can have different uh, data encoding. So that's actually not related to security, but, but related to compatibility. Um, the client and the server can either uh, encode the data as, as binary data or as XML data. So XML is, is mostly used for, for compatibility reasons. Binary encoding is, is much more performant. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, the steps uh, when, when connecting to an OPC server, uh, basically always the same. As a first step, step uh, you create a secure channel. So this is an, an, uh, basically represented by an OPC UA service. Uh, part of that uh, creating the open secure channel is an exchange of certificates. Uh, we can have uh, certificates for identification of the client and uh, for identification of the server. Uh, so uh, at this point of time, the focus is on, on uh, application instance certificate. So when the client or when the server is installed on an, an host computer, then the an certificate is created for that uh, application instance. And, and basically we, you can control the, or the permissions to access a certain server uh, for an application which is, is installed on a certain host. And also uh, there is uh, OPC UA uh, foresees the concept of, of software certificate on product level. 
uh, but but this is uh, currently not uh, specified and uh, so they they have a placeholder for that but it's currently not not really defined in the OPC UA specification uh, uh, when the secure channel is created uh, can uh, the client can request uh, different security modes so uh, non meets means there there is no security measure uh, used uh, but uh, there are also is also the possibility to sign just sign the messages and uh, also there's a possibility to sign and encrypt messages that are exchanged between client and server and as I, I mentioned before there is Oh, okay, this is related to the channel. So there is a lifetime security token, which is valid as long as the channel exists. And then based on the channel, uh, the actual session, the actual connection is created on application level, where we have the user identification. So the identification can be, uh, if we, are looking for security uh, can be based uh, on username password combination can be based on on um, uh, x509 uh, key or an, on a an, uh, user token provided by different uh, servers uh, so uh, OAuth server or, or some other identification mechanism as i said before the session uh, as a timeout, and, and after session timeout, uh, you would reactivate the session and, and use a different key uh, for the encryption. So that's basically uh, and the, are the topics related to creating a secure uh, connection between uh, OPC server and OPC client. Okay, so the next topic would be uh, providing the, the project information. So when an, an OPC client has connected to the uh, OPC server, it needs to know which devices are there, how is the topology, how is the network topology. And uh, so as I said before, uh, the, the information model for FTT is based on the OPC UA for devices. And OPC UA for devices is a um, very uh, fundamental base for a lot of, of companion specifications. Uh, for instance, for analyzer devices, auto ID devices, FDI, uh, different types of machines, MT Connect, PacML, and so on. All those uh, different companion specs are based on OPC UA for devices. So if you know how to, to use information provided uh, by, by uh, according to OPC UA for devices, you are able to read uh, information from quite a big bandwidth of devices and that's why we we are using OPC UA for devices also as a base and uh, OPC UA uh, for devices defines how a project uh, structure is provided so there's a general device model that foresees different classes of device equipment so uh, component type is an abstract class uh, a device type, uh, software type, block type, so, so different types of equipment, including software. Uh, we are not supporting software type. So, but, but uh, device top block type is uh, something that we can represent with the DTM. And so we are supporting this. Uh, and uh, so the device model in, uh, defines how to represent a single device and the devices all are represented as a flat list in a node called device set. 
Also, OPC UA for devices uh, defines a device communication model. So basically, here we can have description of connection points. So how to connect? How is the device connected to a network? We have description of networks and then basically description of protocol support. And then there's this device integration host model, which uh, basically defines how to represent the topology as, as seen from the server. Just to, to provide some examples uh, for, for describing the communication topology. So the start point for browsing information in an OPC server always is the in, in nodes called objects. And then below that we, we have other nodes, so we have the device set node where all the devices are provided as a flat list. And we have a network set where the description for a network is provided. And then each device can have a connection point and there can be a relation defined and um, connects to a relation that, that says, okay, this connection point is connected to the network. So that's basically a uh, possibility on, on the way how to present the communication topology. And then uh, we have the uh, representation of a project structure. So as I said before, uh, objects is always the starting point. We already talked about device sets. So it does not look like a flat list, but it's still a flat list of devices. Uh, we still have the network set. And then uh, what's new here is basically the starting point for describing the, the uh, topology uh, is provided. So uh, here the device topology node says the, the starting point for, for creating the Oh, okay, the the starting point for for seeing the topology is this network A card. Let's see how this works. Um, okay, so just I I was not sure how good you are going to see this picture. Uh, it's just increased. Okay, so we are starting from the host where the OPC server runs, and the OPC a server first sees the network card A as, as, as device, as, as access to the topology. And then it sees, okay, this one is, has a connection point and it's connected to network A. And then uh, network A is connected to station one and via an, a connection processor and connection uh, communication uh, processor. And then station A has also an CPU and which also has a connection point. And then to that connection point, we have uh, network B connected and uh, net, uh, via a connection point, we have a network B device connected and okay, station two is, is hidden down here at the moment, but you, you can believe me there's a station two with with a communication module again. So the, this basically the figure represents such a network topology. Okay, so the, the next uh, slide basically points out that I would like to provide a an, an demo here. Let's see how this works out, okay. Uh, I hope you can see this. Uh, I have increased the, the font size, so it's it's currently a little bit differently organized for myself. Uh, this is the FIT server management. So uh, this is not really the FIT server. It's a console that allows you to start and stop parts of the of the FIT server. You can uh, start the core service. Uh, the OPC UA service and I have not started the web server at this moment because I'm I'm interested in the OPC UA server. 
And then um, this is uh, a general OPC UA client uh, provided by Unified Automation. And when I connect to the, the FIT server, to the OPC component of the FIT server, I, I do the, see the device set. So these are all the devices inside the, the project. Uh, I see the networks. So these are the networks inside the OPC stack. So by, by the names you recognize I have some hard. Uh, I have an in-real bus from Weidmüller. So that's an, an Weidmüller specific protocol. And I have some mode bus TCP. And, uh, Okay, uh, this is something I should explain. Not all of these DTMs are FTT3 DTMs. Some are FTT2 DTMs. And then I have the, the device topology. So this is basically what I see from the, from the OPC server as a starting point. And, and you see, it looks like I have connected three uh, different communication uh, uh, devices here. So, so uh, this is basically this. Uh, I, I have a topology with, with three branches. And yeah, this is the according to the OPC UA4 devices. It's not a very nice starting point. So, actually, what you would now do is you would try to, to go through um, those those uh, nodes and then you have down here the, the channels and, and you have the connected networks and you could browse through the networks for the different uh, protocols. So there are uh, the connection points that are connected to the network. And by going through there, you, you could uh, basically recognize, okay, so this connection point is uh, connected to the network. And actually, there should be a an, an relationship that, that says it's, it's part of a an, an device. And then you can, can go to the device. So believe me, the information is there. Uh, but it's hard to read. So uh, for this purpose, uh, we have created an, an FTT specific OPC client. And if I connect to, to the server, so I uh, use the, the an discovery server to, to find the endpoint and for this demo, and then I can connect and uh, you see, okay, I have uh, three devices that are basically starting points for, for communication. So uh, the only uh, FTT3 uh, uh, DTMs are the demo communication DTM and the, the uh, logics uh, from, from Flowsoft DTM. The other DTMs are uh, FTT2 DTMs. Uh, Okay, so so that's basically the way how to to uh, it's possible to represent the the topology like we are used to in in FTG. Okay, let's see if I how I can come back to my presentation. So so as you have seen, the the topology is is encoded here in, in this information and it's possible to, to recreate the topology and also it's possible to, to represent uh, vendor specific protocols and, and vendor specific topologies. Okay. So uh, when we talk about accessing device information and, and device and, and DTM provides quite a lot of different information. So uh, there is identity information. Uh, so for, for offline identification and online identification, we have uh, device data. So uh, that's basically 
uh, typically parameters. There's a description of the I.O. values. Uh, it's not mandatory that the I.O. data is available from the from the DTM. Typically, the PLC is, is using that data. Uh, and it's possible to, to uh, the DTM also provides other information like the network management information, uh, information about uh, functions. Uh, so uh, functions without graphical user interface, we are not supporting graphical user interfaces, but, but we are supporting functions without graphical user interfaces. And also uh, we can access uh, information about the uh, the documents, so manuals and, and so on, are, uh, are provided by the DTM, and we are able to, to provide this also uh, with the OPC server. So, so the OPC server is able to support a lot of different uh, uh, documentation. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to look at the time. Uh, let me cut this a little bit short. Uh, if you look at the OPC uh, UA companion spec for, for FTT, we have uh, defined a standardized mapping of the uh, device information. So we are mapping information from the DTM instance to, to such an object, and such a device representation. And also we are mapping the information, the type information into the OPC server. Uh, so it, it's not just the, the project information is, is mapped, but, but also uh, type information is mapped. And we think that this is quite important if you look at IoT use cases. Uh, since I'm already over time, I'm not going to, to extend this too much. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think I'm, it's better to, to end the session, uh, this presentation here. If you have questions, please contact me. Uh, as I said before, uh, participation in project groups is open to to uh, any FTT member. So if you are interested in this work and, and would like to drive the direction of the work, uh, there's always the possibility to, to attend in those project groups or to participate in those project groups. Okay. And that's the end. So I would like to hand back to Volker. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this great presentation of possibilities we've got with these new specifications. Um, I've seen here some questions. Um, maybe I can hand over them to you. So, uh, first question is, is uh, JSON encoding planned for the OPC UA connection? Uh, to be honest, uh, I think yes. Um, we don't care much about those OPC specific things. We are using uh, a toolkit from Unified Automation for, for the implementation. And if the toolkit supports the encoding, uh, Pit Server also is going to support the encoding. Okay, I think the next question is already answered. Can you tell us which OPC UA stack you use for the FTT OPC UA server? I think you already answered it. Yeah, so it's it's uh, it's so the default component that's delivered with the FIT server is based on unified automation on the SDK from, from unified automation. And the last question regarding OPC UA I have here at the moment, does the OPC UA communication model in FTT3 support remote access via IT networks, uh, VPN or similar? Yes, so uh, actually we had several demos of the OPC UA server that were executed on Azure, for instance. So it's possible to set up an 
a remote uh, server and uh, uh, use that, uh, you know, access the remote server via OPC way. We also had uh, demos uh, setting up the FIT server and together with an OPC UA uh, component in, in Raspberry, for instance. So uh, Glenn mentioned platform independence. We did test and, and execute demos on, on Windows, Linux, and even Raspberry Pi. Okay, I think at the moment uh, I have one remaining question. It's about the FIT server common component. Maybe Renato can uh, answer this question. Uh, Renato, are you? Yeah, uh, I'm still here. <laughs> um, so the question is, uh, what is the plan to handle cybersecurity alerts and uh, update the FIT server CC? Is there is this already a uh, planning available? No. Maybe I can help. So, um, basically, uh, something that that I try to convey is we have for different tasks we have different project groups, and uh, most of the technical oriented project groups are managed. Uh, by working group ANS. And we also do have a project group security. So if uh, we get information about a uh, possible security problem, uh, this project group security uh, is, is, they are basically always active. Uh, they do an, an analysis and then basically we are uh, Based on the technical analysis, we are going to uh, handle the security issue with uh, basically updating the CC. So uh, the, the corresponding CC, so for instance, in the recent DTM CC, we had an update because of a security issue with a common, so with a third party component. Uh, so, so it's always, we, we have project group security doing the analysis and then the product managers basically take care of how to, to integrate uh, this into the corresponding pro products. So product managers, uh, the CCBs basically are taking the role of the, of the product managers. Okay. Thank you very much for this explanation, Thomas. Um, I, you, as you can see at the moment on your uh, desktop, uh, we, uh, uh, at the, we are at the second topic on this slide, uh, on the first topic. So again, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for this your presentation. And now, when we go ahead, uh, we will get a presentation of uh, Manfred Manfred Kundel. Um, he's a colleague of mine at m and He's used to work with the working group uh, uh, architecture and specification for many years, and he's, uh, he's taking care of uh, the m and FTT projects and uh, products like FTT container and DTM manager, for example. Um, and he's also coordinating all the projects we had with the FTT group. So, for example, F the FIT server. So, Manfred, uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Give me a second uh, to give control to you. So, it's yours, Manfred. Manfred, we can't hear you. Uh, no. Yes, it's good. Uh, we see and we see your presentation. I can can hear you. Okay, so you also see the the presentation. Yes. And yeah. uh, okay. The laser. Good. Yeah. Then also welcome everybody from from my side. 
to this presentation. Um, I will give you some more details about the desktop common components. Um, if the presentation decides to move forward. Yeah. So uh, Renato already gave some introduction what the different common components are and I will specifically specifically talk about uh, the desktop common components now. Um, so the the presentation is just split in two parts. I will basically go through some of the main features in some slides and then I also prepared a demo. So the desktop CC is also known as the FTT container component. Okay. So it used to be a, a product from m, m for actually a, quite a long time since the beginning of FTT. And now it's also the recommended common component from the FTT group. In a nutshell, um, the FTT container component provides an environment to execute DTMs basically in any kind of application. Um, so it can be used for custom made frame applications. I think Renato was showing a screenshot from a Hilcher application, which, uh, which uses this component, for example. Um, it simplifies the maintenance effort for this kind of application. For example, um, the integration of FTT3 was done, let's say, for major part was done by us inside this component. Of course, there's also something to do in the application, but uh, it's much less effort to add something like a new major FTT version than it would be without using the component. It hides the complexity of FTT as much as possible. So in the end, it basically gives an option to, to reduce cost and to increase efficiency. It's also the base of some other products. I uh, will talk a little bit about this later. So, so this is a, a top level overview, which also shows the scope of this component. So basically the component is the blue block here in the middle. And it provides some, you know, some parts which for managing different aspects of the FTT specification, like the DTM catalog or managing a project, managing the DTM topology inside a project, uh, working with proxies. We may see some of this a bit more detailed later on in the demo. Um, it also provides an implementation for, for the version interoperability between the various FTT versions. Of course, it's also using the so-called transformers from the specification, but it basically implements the logic for this interoperability and also a concept to, to run DTMs in external processes. So it's not just one process for the whole application. The DTMs can be run or in certain situations have to be run in external processes. Um, then we have this greenish brownish block here, which is uh, the actual application which um, integrates the component. So that's not in in the scope of the component itself. Um, but there are some kind of callbacks, callback interfaces. So where the interfaces are provided by the component and then the actual code is provided by the application. So 
most importantly the UI. So the component itself does not have any UI. Um, of course, it can help to to render the UIs of the DTMs. The the actual data storage is provided by the applications. Um, optionally, the application can also provide communication channels and um, basically provide a sync for logging. And then we have, of course, also the DTMs themselves, um, which are managed by the <laughs> component. So some technical points. The, the API is at the moment is implemented with .NET Framework 4.8. Some of the, the processes which host DTMs in external processes use different technology. For example, the host process for FTT 1.2 is using a native implementation. Uh, the FTT 3 DTMs are currently also hosted in .NET Framework. Um, because th so they are specified to be .NET to support .NET standard, so they can also run in a framework process. Um, the application which integrates the components current, or not currently, is definitely bound to Windows. That also has some historical reasons. Of course, the component was started with support of FTT 1.2 and um, so it would not be possible to to run one or two DTMs on any other platform, and it's also not possible to to just dissect and remove the FTT one support. So the component is bound to Windows, and yeah, we also provide a merge module so that applications can easily create setups and install all the necessary files for the component. Yeah, then some features a bit more detailed. So um, the implementation of the component encapsulates the FTT sequence, like the DTM state machine, for example. So that, that's not something the application developer has to take care of. Uh, it provides a structure API for the typical tasks related to working with DTMs like catalogs or the, the blocks that we already saw in the overview picture. Um, proxies are basically kind of wrappers around the DTM, especially to, to access online functions. So, so basically, if the application wants to execute an online function, for example, or an offline function, it creates an, a proxy and then the proxy internally manages the instance of the DTM. We have some features to, to help with memory and resource management. For example, the component tries to shut down DTMs once they are not needed anymore. So maybe you know that the FTT specification specifies a state machine for a DTM. So in the beginning, it's not loaded. Then if you want to do something with the DTM, it will be started. And then it also consumes memory, obviously. And then uh, if there is no active task by the DTM, if no user interface opened or any running activity, it's possible to shut down the DTM and free that memory again. Um, especially for FTT2 and 3 DTMs, is missing here, uh, to use this possibility that the specification provides to load instance data only on demand. Um, yeah, and 
this is just also an example because we saw that especially during a catalog update when every DTM which is started uh, which is installed on the system is also started during the catalog update that can bring applications even to a limit and in the worst case even crash the application because all the DTMs are instantiated and that's also handled by an external process then to avoid this problem or even a pool of external processes. So the component tries to abstract the FTT versions so that a developer um, ideally it doesn't have to write specific code for FTT 1, 2 or 3 DTMs. They can just handle everything via an abstracted API because sometimes this is not possible because the versions are too different so and then it's of course also possible in the code to switch uh, or to cast a proxy for example to an FTT version specific interface. For the FTT1, the maybe a bit older feature uh, because the FTT1 data types are provided as XML documents and schemas. The component also provides a set of .NET classes um, so that the application developer does not have to deal with XML parsing. Of course, that's not required anymore for FTT2 and 3 because the, the data types are already based on .NET. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this, I think, on the overview slide. So it's possible to start DTMs in separate processes, which means that if the DTM crashes, uh, the, it's not that the whole application itself crashes. Um, <clears throat> and we have some extensive features for diagnosis, so, so logging, both from the component itself internally and also to collect all the logging information from the DTMs. And um, yeah, of course, one major point is also the, the interoperability, not, not just between FTT versions, but in general between frames and DTMs, because if we have a, a common component, which is used by many applications, then we also have a, a very high coverage with all the DTMs which are available. And then we can make sure that the frame which is based on the component has, or at least the, the component inside has already been tested and used in the field with a large amount of DTMs. Yeah, so it's also possible for the component to provide a communication channel. So that can be useful in, in certain situations. For example, if the application is, is a control system and, and this control system knows how to connect to the devices, then it can basically provide a channel into the, uh, into the component. And then the component can use this channel to connect device DTMs directly without a communication DTM. So the application kind of acts as the COM DTM in that case. And yeah, as I said before, it's possible to listen to a lot of logging events, especially then for diagnostic purposes. Um, yeah, and there are a lot of possibilities to tweak and configure the components. Um, many of them have been added over the time by specific requests from application developers. So these are just a few mentioned here. That's so possible to configure the threading model to decide whether or not DTMs are started in separate processes in 
many separate processes or just in one it's possible to as i mentioned before to use this feature that dtms are shut down if they are not needed and also then to configure the number of dtms that should be started in parallel also obviously configuration of some paths and many more i think this would be too much detail now here um yeah some things which are explicitly not in the scope of the component uh, of course all the application and domain specific features so component just uh, um, helps to integrate ftt but it doesn't um, have any specific features for any specific industry or anything so this will be added by the application the the whole ui is also responsibility of the application so i will later have a short demo of a console application which doesn't have any ui uh, that's of course also possible um, of course the component helps to embed the dtm uis into the application ui and also the whole persistency the database is in the responsibility of the application so the component basically just provides chunks of data which then have to be persisted by the application but the component does not directly save data into a, <coughs> any database or something like this um yeah this is just some of the 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 uh, usages of the component so we are using the component in our own ftt container application um, which is also available as a brand labeled oem version then i think we saw in james's part of the presentation the dtm inspector also uses the component as a base and then can be integrated in many custom applications by our customers um, okay this is now just uh, some comparison between the the desktop cc and the fit server cc I, I'll, I'll try to explain this picture so the desktop cc here included in a frame application it's also referred to as a single user frame so it basically there's one user using this as a classic desk windows desktop application um, but this so it does not mean that it's not possible to use a shared database so as i said before the way how the data is persisted is in the scope of the application and it's possible that the application uses a common or server-based database to persist the data which then means it's possible that uh, a second instance of this application which is running on different pc and used by a different user can also access this shared data and the ftt specification has a concept for locking of data sets so so this means this user could for example open the ui of a certain dtm and that dtm would lock its own section in the database and then the second user would see this data as read only for example and after uh, the other user is done the information could be synchronized with this application so this kind of multi-user scenario is possible even with this desktop component but uh, as mentioned before so it's 
bound to to the Windows platform and basically to desktop applications. And it supports all three FTT versions. And we just uh, in comparison to this, we look at the architecture of the FIT server. That's a bit different. So here, the whole server or the, the core server part is an actual server application. And um, it obviously also has some kind of a database. And then this server can be used by multiple completely different clients, like the OPC server, which we saw just before. Um, it could provide a web application even to, to users, which then open this web application on mobile phones or uh, yeah, on, on rich desktop applications as well. So the, the platforms which can be used by the clients is then not limited anymore. So it can be any anything that basically can open a browser or even a protocol like OPC UA. The, and the FIT server is mainly focusing on FTT3. I have FTT2 here in, in brackets because uh, it, um, so the FIT server can run FTT2 DTMs but cannot provide the UIs of FTT2 DTMs, for example, on a mobile phone. So that's why it's, let's say, partially supported only. So this is the main kind of difference between the architectures. I hope this picture was not too, too colorful or too overloaded. Um, yeah, then I would come to live demo. I'm not, uh, Volker, maybe quick question. How are we in time now? I think for a demonstration, it would be okay. Okay, yeah. So I prepared a virtual machine for this. And basically, I can first show the, the application in quotes uh, first. So it's just a console application called FCC demo. And now, so you see that the first step is to start the frame or basically to start up the, the common component inside. The green text is now the logging that comes from the component. So it's set to, to a verbose logging mode. You can see it's already doing plenty of things. Here is also one configuration option. So it's possible to configure the supported FTT versions. If I would, for example, say I do not want to support FTT1, I would not get FTT1 DTMs into the catalog. Um, yeah, so that's just now the component started up and ready. Then I'm actually now updating the catalog. You can see a lot of stuff is going on. Um, there are actually just two DTMs installed on this system. This is the, the IOLink FTT3 generic DTM and a, a, a simulation communication DTM. So, because we also will use the same machine later for a demo of this DTM. So, you can basically see after the catalog update, it can list the various installed device types here. So it's it's one DTM, the generic DTM, which provides several device types based on the IO link DDs. Um, so then I'm now actually creating uh, and a small topology with one instance of the COM DTM and one of the device DTM. So you see the device that DTM reports some error here. That's just uh, 
basically a log output from the DTM, but it will not prevent it from actually working. And as the last step, I'm basically reading the device status of the device DTM. So the FTT specification specifies a common interface to get this Namur status from a device DTM. So as we have a <clears throat> simulation DTM, it's not a surprise that status is okay. And um, yeah, you can see that when we want to exit, there's also some cleanup being done. The DTMs are shut down and so on. We have a quick look at the source code of this, I'll make it maybe a little bit bigger. So I think it's not, yeah, in, in the, it's not the time to go now really too much into detail. Um, so maybe just the major steps. Uh, first of all, I'm just getting the, the path where everything is executed and then initialize a helper class kind of, which manages the frame. Um, okay, maybe let's just go through this here first. So, and then I provide some functions in this frame to execute the various steps that we saw, like print the catalog, add the communication DTM, <clears throat> add the device DTM, and then read the device status. So, yeah, maybe just to get an idea, we can jump into this method here. So, basically, the, the component has an API to manage a project. So, we call this the frame project. And this project has a flat list of all the DTMs. So, I can basically get a, it's kind of a handle to this DTM. Uh, every DTM is identified by the unique system tag that's also part of the FTT specification. Then I will open a proxy. So that's what I mentioned before, that the proxy is kind of a wrapper around an instance of the DTM. So here, when I call open DTM, this will go through the state machine and start the DTM. And now for the online operations and to read the device status, I so until this point, it wouldn't matter if it's FTT 1, 2, or 3 DTM, the, the code would be the same. But um, so this interface is specific FTT 3 interface. So I'm basically casting now to an FTT 3 proxy, and then I can make this call to this FTT3 interface and return the result. Okay, so I would like then to to stop at this point. I think this is not really the... Yeah, we don't really have time to go too much into detail and I think this would not be very helpful now. Okay, then... This would be the end of my part. Are there any questions? So thank you very much, Manfred, for this detailed presentation. Um, yes, there are some questions. I would provide them to mm -hmm. you. Uh, first is, uh, are there known problems while using uh, WPF for, uh, each, <laughs> uh, for example, weak event plat uh, pattern? Um, I'm not aware about the weak event pattern, but I was laughing because, so there are problems, yes. Um, there are problems because of, so if if libraries are used, so the, in, in WPF there are some popular libraries which, which yeah, provide nice controls and, and 
like tree controls and buttons and whatever. And it's possible that, for example, two DTMs use the same library, but in a different version, or even the, the application uses such a library in version A and DTM uses it in version B. And then if they are loaded into the same process, uh, this causes conflicts. And a similar problem can be with style, uh, is it in WPF called style sheets? I'm not sure. But there's also this concept where you can inherit styles uh, and that can also cause trouble if the if the application and the DTM are developed independently but then running together. So and to solve this problem, we are using the external processes and even application domains. So again, I'm not aware of, about the weak uh, event problem. I would be interested though if that can be. Provide some details. No. Uh, hopefully, we, you were able to answer this question. Another question is for frame common component. Any findings on number of DTMs that can be started in parallel without having performance uh, issues? I don't have an actual number. Um, so I. I mentioned the catalog update so there we saw that so for ftt1 especially we have some some big dtm libraries which can be used from different vendors so so device vendors which provide large families of devices sometimes provide the dtms in in libraries um, and let's say if you install two or three of these libraries and do a catalog update inside one process, it can already uh, reach the limit, especially in a 32-bit process. So I, I can't give you an, an exact number, but, and then I guess if, if you use processes to host DTMs, it also depends basically on the power of on the memory and so on of the machine. And to be fair, I would say the typical use case of such a desktop application is not is is maybe not to run hundreds or thousands of DTMs in parallel. So maybe you have a, a project which has one thousand DTMs in the project, but if you open the project, this doesn't mean they're all started in parallel because it, this the desktop uh, FTT application is typically used for parameterization. So you would open one or a couple of DTMs, do something and then close them again. So I hope this will, could answer the question. Okay, thank you, Manfred. And uh, the last question I have here is a uh, uh, project database. So if in bracket is mentioned saved configuration from FTT container. Can it be used in a fit server? Um, currently, the concept is that you you have to export the project. So the FTT container can export a project, but the format then is not the proprietary file format of FTT container, but it's the standardized export format. So standardized by the FTT specification. And then this can be imported into the, the FIT server. So it's not possible that the FIT server opens, that it directly opens in project file which was created by the ftt container okay thank you manfred so up to now no open questions so then 
Thank you, Manfred, again for your presentation and the demonstration of the frame common component. Um, I think now we are near to the end of our walk through the FTT3 uh, landscape. Um, in our next presentation slot, we will hear Glenn again. He uh, will give us an overview about FTT licensing and agreements and cost. And uh, so, Glenn, it's again your turn. Give me one second to provide you the screen. I hope the screen is yours now. Yeah, yes, we can see you. it. Great. I'm sorry, just get my screen organized here. Okay, so thank you. Appreciate all the other presentations. I always learn something when I sit through these sessions. It's great to have such talent doing these presentations. So I would like to just briefly cover, uh, you've heard a lot about the tools and so on of uh, that support the FTT3 standard. And I'm often asked about how do I get access to these tools? What do these tools cost and so on? And so that's what we'll cover uh, in this topic. So developing and releasing FTT3 products, what does it take? Um, all FTT3 vendors must have an FTT vendor ID. If you're a part of any of the network associations or so on, you'll, you'll probably already be familiar with this. They've had this in place for a lot of years. Um, and we are implementing that now with FTT3. So how do you get a vendor ID? Um, it's obtained by completing the FTT standard collaboration agreement. You can get a copy of this from the business office. Um, when you request it, you'll get a vendor ID added to it. And once you complete the form, that becomes your official vendor ID. Uh, if you're a third party developer, if you develop uh, DTMs, for instance, for other companies, um, those vendors that you're developing for also need to have a vendor ID. So if you are doing third-party work, make sure you ask your customer, do they have a vendor ID before you begin that development activity? Once you get the vendor ID, then that also gives you access to the specification and all the ancillary documents and so on that you need to uh, support your ac development activity. Um, all FDT3 servers and DTMs must incorporate the common components. Um, you license these tools from the FDT group, and we'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. In the case of the desktop uh, common components that Manfred uh, Gundel just went through, is you get the license for those from M&M software. But for the server and the DTMs, those come directly from the FDT group. Um, and as has been mentioned a couple of times now by myself and by James, is that all FTT3 DTMs must be certified before they are released to the marketplace. And they must also be accessible in the FTT hub. Now, the nice thing for you as a vendor, or as a developer of DTMs, is you don't have to worry about getting your DTM up into the hub that becomes an automatic part of the certification process, as James mentioned. You do have access to a portal where you can maintain that and so on and so forth. Uh, that's a little out of the scope of today's discussion, but just understand that the certification process itself will ensure that your DTM is ex properly accessible up in the hub. So a little bit more about the standard collaboration agreement that I mentioned. It's a mutually assigned document between you and the FDT group. So you get the vendor ID as part of that. It's the legal basis for the development of FDT3 products. In other words, you need this document in place to be able to develop FDT3 products. It provides that all uh, DTMs must be certified and that they're accessible in the FDT hub. 
And one component that was asked for by a number of vendors is it provides a mutual non-disclosure agreement about your development activities and about the FDT uh, development activities, and it provides consolidated damages. So often you'll find that if you have an attorney look at these, they appreciate the document because it narrows the potential scope of things. How do you get it? You just uh, send an email to Katie, who is uh, managing this entire conference for us in the background here. Send her an email at the business office at fdtgroup.org. She'll give you a partly completed document that includes your tentative business or vendor ID. Uh, you sign that and return it to the business office and it'll be countersigned and you will get a completed copy, which then gives you the official ID and the access to other documents you need, and then you're clear to develop FDT3 products. So when you're ready to develop products, then there's licenses for the various parts of the standard. So these licenses costs are based on your membership level, and we'll take a look at the specifics of this in just a second. But in general, it's a one-time licensing fee plus some type of annual maintenance agreement. The annual maintenance agreement, of course, gets you updates to those uh, components that you're licensing, and it frankly, it helps fund the maintenance of the ongoing maintenance of those components. So there is a licensing agreement for each tool, and so you need your vendor ID first, which you would have gotten through the standard collaboration agreement. Uh, you then contact the business office for a copy of the license for whatever particular product it is that you're interested in, like the DTM common components, the server common components, and so on. The nice thing is all of the standard licensing agreements are the same. The only thing that changes about them is the named component. You just sign that and return it to the business office, and then you'll get a completed copy from the business office and you'll get access to the particular software that you're uh, wishing to license. So here, this gives you a view of, of what the license costs are. And you can see the general structure um, is shown at the top here. So you see there's a list price, and this is always in euros. And then there's the various levels of membership within the organization are of course non-memberships. Then we have a try before you buy so that you can briefly use the components for a limited cost to see if they're what you're looking for. So let me just use this as an example to get your vendor ID and so on for um, the list price of this is 15,000 euros. But if you're a member, a paying member, you see that it costs you nothing. You'll get a 100% discount on that. If you're a non-member, then you must pay this 15,000 euro fee. Okay, and let me just illustrate one more because they all follow basically the same uh, pattern. Here's the DTM common component license. So if you wanted to license the DTM common components, here's the list price of it, 9,500 euros. If you're a corporate member, you get a 50% discount off of that. If you're an affiliate member, you get a 20% discount. If you're not a member, again, you get no discount. There is this try before you buy component. Just be aware that it's a non-refundable fee, although it can be used as a discount if you then choose to license the component on an ongoing basis. And if you have questions about try before you buy, just contact the business office. Uh, we've got some more information on that. But this is the general structure for all of the tools and so on that you've heard about today. Um, and I would just ask for the desktop common components the, where it says market prices, please contact m and Software, Folker or Monfred can help you with that. And they will be happy to quote the appropriate prices to you for those components that they supply. And then here is uh, what James was talking about with uh, DTM inspector. And I think somebody asked him some details about the licensing issues. So you can see there's the DTM inspector tool and healthy discounts again for paying members and so on. So you get the how that general program works. These prices are all up on our website. 
And so if you ever have a question about any of them or you need to show it to a colleague or something like that, please just go to our website and you'll have the latest version of all this information uh, directly there. Uh, Volker, that's it for my overview of the um, licensing and agreements and so on. And I'm just looking at the questions and I don't see any related questions, but I'll just pause for a minute in case you see something, Volker. No, I see no open question. Uh, we received one question during your presentation, but it's not about licensing and cost. It's about, uh, again, WPF. I think I will forward this to Manfred after we oh, finished. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That one, yeah. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Volker. I turn it back to you then. So thank you very much, Glenn, for your second presentation of today's seminar. I think it was a clear overview about our cost and license structure. Um, so give me a second. I just received a question. Uh, if want, uh, I'm sorry. If want to try before we buy, do we need a vendor ID before is the question? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is no, you do not. Um, the try before you buy agreement, which is a separate agreement, specifically prohibits you from developing and releasing products using the try before you buy. So as a result, you don't need a vendor ID because if after that trial you said, yes, this is exactly what we was hope were hoping it would be, we want to license it at that point, then you'd have to have a vendor ID in place. So feel free to exercise to try before you buy. And if it's what you want, then you get the vendor ID from us. So it's a quite easy chance to test FTT overall. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, Some people have uh, never been in an FTT development environment and would just like to have a look at the tools and how they work. And this is a great way of doing it. Oh, no, we got new questions. So does a license for former DTM inspector include the update to FTT 3? Yes, if you've been, if you're under maintenance, then you will get the updated version of the DTM inspector. So uh, I want to add one topic. Uh, so if you're under maintenance for FTT 3, so it's because the, the uh, vendor of the tool change. So at FTT3, it's an M&M tool, yes, and from FTT4, yep. it's an uh, uh, FTT group tool. So I, th I think your you, your answer was for FTT4, uh, FT DTM Inspector 4. So Yes, correct. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. So I hope this was the answer to this question. And the third one is, uh, whether server CC is ready to be integrated into a system. Uh, I think this is a, a question to to one of the speakers before. Yeah, I think we should postpone that one till later. Yeah, maybe we can put it to the end, yes. So, okay, again, Glenn, thank you very much for your two presentations. Um, now we come to the last topic of the agenda. So it's my presentation to get uh, together with uh, Manfred. So I will take over the presentation. So can you see my presentation mode? No, no. No, give me a second. No, now it should uh, be. Coming up, yeah. Yeah, great. So, my friend and I will do a presentation about the DTM uh, IODD interpreter. Um, I will give you a short introduction, and then Manfred will give a demonstration of this uh, DTM. Um, so, um, in general, the IODD interpreter takes the IODDs of, uh, for, for IO-Link devices currently from the IODD finder of the um, 
IOLINK group, there were about, um, I think this is wrong, it's not 5,000 IODD files. So um, there were about, uh, there are IODD files of about uh, uh, 21,000 devices for 111 vendors available. So a really huge amount of devices are available for FTT if, uh, when you use IODD files. And so the idea was to use this generic um, DTM to enable uh, IODD file, uh, IOLINK devices for FTT and vice versa. So in general, uh, the FTT group has the idea to, uh, that generic DTMs can enable uh, a lot of devices for FTT in general. So this is only a first step for this, and uh, but it is quite easy to enable a lot of devices for FTT. Um, Okay, uh, let me say some words about the history. So the I, there is an IODD interpreter DTM available for FTT 1.2 since about 10 years, maybe one or two years more. Um, this project was driven by um, 10 huge IOLINK vendors. And in the meantime, 14 vendors are part of this community and they provide this DTM to the market. Um, and uh, this DTM for FTT1 is one of the main IOLINK configuration tools in the market. There are several others, but due to this uh, huge amount of IOLINK vendors, it's a, it's a main uh, configuration tool. And the idea was to take the, um, take the uh, interpreter part and uh, put it uh, to FTT3 to get an FTT3 IOLINK DTM. So Manfred, I would hand over to you to get an, uh, for the demonstration. Okay. So, should be yours now? Yeah. Should see the virtual machine again? Yes. Okay, so it's the same uh, VM again, like I just used for this other demo. So now I will just start the, the FTT container. Um, and then, yeah, so the generic IOLINK DTM, the, the current version of it is installed with some demo or uh, not, not so the with some io link dds that we got from the io link finder to provide this demo um, and also so because the io link annex, annex itself is still in development so there is not a real physical communication dtm so we just have a simulation communication dtm um, this simulation communication DTM also uses the IOLINK DD, which is then used by the device DTM. So I can just add one of them here. Um, so the simulation DTM also uses the, the DD, so it can provide some sort of feasible data, but of course, uh, yeah, there are limits to this, so it cannot really compare to a real COM DTM and a real physical device. So maybe to show one typical FTT use case, just go online with both DTMs. Um, and now, so the DTM supports offline data and online data. So which means I can use the load from device function first to, yeah, it's, it's always a discussion whether it's upload or download. So, so to load the data from the physical device into the offline storage. Um, yeah, then I could, for example, disconnect again. 
and open the offline parameter view. So the, the parameters in the menu, which is shown here, is basically based on the DD. So we we'll just use a simple one here for the identification. Um, so you see it, it uploaded some values from the physical device, which then actually came from the simulation. So the data may not really make any sense, but it's somehow uh, feasible. Um, yeah, then I can, for example, change this parameter here. So you can also see that the DTM provides some information about the parameter that's also taken from the DD. Um, and then I can go online again. And now send this offline changes to the physical device. So I get this information that, um, of course, the device may change some values accordingly now, and so it, it may not match 100%. So it, it recommends to do an upload again to be really sure to have the correct values. But I, I will skip that for now. Um, then we can open the online parameter view, which looks pretty much the same like the offline view, except uh, we can also now show the device status. That's basically the status that we already saw in the console frame before. And um, yeah, you can also see that the value was now stored in the device. Yeah, so again, the, the menus are now specific for this particular sensor. So I think it's not very interesting to browse through this here. Um, you can see that it's possible to, to make changes. <clears throat> Yeah, so the, the UIs are, of course, FTT3, uh, HTML UIs. So they could also be shown by the FIT server then in the web application. And also the parameters would be exposed to the OPC server. This, if the DTM would be running inside the FIT server. Okay, I think that's all for a quick overview then Volker. Okay, thank you very much for this demonstration. I will take back control of the screen. Um, oh, sorry. So, I'm back with my presentation. Um, yeah, what is the status for the IODD interpreter? As I said before, there is an FTT1 um, DTM available. This DTM you can uh, is provided by M&M, &M and uh, this FTT3 DTM will be provided uh, in the future by the FTT group. So it's a product of the FTT group. At the end, then the beta version is available at the moment, as you have seen, as, as you have seen in this presentation. But it bases only on a um, simulation communication DTM. The reason is, as Manfred said, there is uh, the IO Link an, uh, annex is still in work, still in progress. So before we can develop uh, communication DTMs. We need to wait for this annex. There is a um, project group established one or two months ago, and 
uh, the project group is working on this annex and uh, will then provide it to the developers. Um, the final release of the DT, uh, ITD interpreter will take uh, place then if a COM DTM is available that everything is uh, tested in a good way. Um, yes, so the one open topic is um, man, uh, Glenn talked about the license uh, topics of the FTT group. Um, IoTD interpreter will be an additional product of the FTT group, which uh, will then also have a license model. In, at the moment, this is still under dis discussion. So um, it's also a question to the audience. If you have ideas how your company would use this product and uh, what the appropriate license would be for this uh, for, for such uh, a use case. So we can have a discussion here or if, if you have la later on an idea, so you can contact Glenn, Katie or me and uh, we will forward it to the right persons. So I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, sorry. And uh, it's the question, are there any open questions? I have a look to, to my list. Um, there are no new questions regarding IODD interpreter. Um, I have still some open questions I would uh, forward to uh, some presenters. So I think this is a question to Renato. Um, are you still available? In, yes. In line? Yes, great. Um, uh, I think I, I read it before, whether server CC is ready to be integrated into a system. Uh, so I think that it's mean the fits cost are to integrate it to, okay. Um, there's uh, something like a, a, a client component, this exists already, but, but I think the documentation is not finished until now to, to see how it's possible to use. When okay. I'm correct, I, I think it would be also already possible to do it. Mm. Manfred, am I right? I think it's possible because the only yeah. thing missing is the documentation for the client component. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have some samples and some small tutorials, but not the extensive documentation. But technically, I mean the the current implementation of the OPC UA server and the web server. So the OPC server that we saw before from Thomas is also using this this client component. And, and, uh, right, and only the extended documentation is missing. And for this, uh, this is all also included in the budget plan. So yeah, we need only a timeline when it will be done. Okay, I think this answered the question. I have no open question anymore when I see right. So, question to the audience. Uh, do you have any additional question? So, please provide it now. And Volker, if I can, while they're doing that, I just want to thank all the speakers today. You know, these are all volunteers that spend a lot of time on FTT related activity in a leadership capacity. And when I think about it, they're behind these uh, gentlemen, there's probably another 70 or so people that work on their committees and working groups and project groups and so on that are also volunteers. So a great thanks to them. But I especially want to uh, just make a mention of uh, Manfred Gundel. Manfred has been an active part of the FDT organizations since I've been around with the FDT group and before that. And uh, Manfred has been promoted within m and it's a very 
a worthwhile promotion, very well deserved, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Monfred because we'll probably see a little less of him in FDT activity, and he certainly has been a large part of our organization for many years. So thank you, Monfred. Yeah, thank you, Glenn, for the nice words. It was always a pleasure, and I think uh, I will be around uh, here and there. <laughs> so thank We're you. We're all glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think there are no more questions, nothing to do for us anymore. So I think I'm at the point in time to thank all the participants and all speakers for joining us today. And uh, um, so if there were any questions coming up, please send it to us. You will receive a handout later on. And uh, I'm looking forward to joining all of you again in the next uh, developer seminar and maybe we will have it again face to face next year. You never know. So I'm sending my best wishes for a good night or nice evening or a good day to all of you. So hope seeing you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you, everybody.